Hello, members of the Grace Church Community Council. I've missed your faces. Pastor Marks, thank you for opening the chapel to host this important meeting about COVID-19. They said we could gather together in small groups, so here we are, guided by spirit and by the strength of our leadership. Amen. Amen. I also want to give thanks to the Lord that I am alive today. As you all know, I am a nurse by profession, but some of you may not know that back in March, I tested positive for COVID-19. Oh, no. <gasps> yes. It was such an eye-opening experience. I told the doctor I was in pain. He did not believe me. I said I was in pain. And he underestimated me. Why was my pain not real? Why did he think I was imagining my pain? When in fact, I know that my pain is centuries old. I told him that I couldn't breathe, that every time I took a deep breath, it felt like a thousand needles were piercing me through my chest. I told him my throat and neck were swollen. He asked me if I was suffering from any stress. I said, well, who isn't? He then said in a nonchalant tone, uh, Naomi? Did I say that right? Great. It looks like it's just a panic attack. I said, no, this isn't anxiety, sir. I can't taste anything, and I lost my sense of smell. He then asked me about my pre-existing conditions and family history. I was growing really tired of his overt biases towards me, so I was like, well, let me see, doctor. I got conditions embedded into my DNA that I ain't even asked for. Meanwhile, I'm living a healthy life. I can't say much about my family history, but I do know that it's comprised of systemic racism, poverty, redlining, food apartheid, PTSD, and trauma. He then interrupted me with, I'm guessing that also includes diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular problems, asthma, and depression, right? I looked at him real hard and said, Doctor, you may not recognize me, but I work on the third floor in pediatrics, and I know we have a limited supply, but you need to test me for COVID-19? ASAP. <laughs> he was like a deer in headlights. He left the room to grab a COVID test, and all I kept thinking about was if I was a regular black patient, he would have sent me home with a psych referral. Mm -hmm. He came back in, shoved that swab up my nose, and told me to go home and quarantine for a week until I got my results. A week. Now, mind you, this was in early March, you know, right before DC started shutting down. So I panicked. I was out of sick days. I already took my vacation and I only had one personal day left. The White House had just declared a global pandemic and I am an essential worker. If I don't work, will I lose my job? And if I get really sick, who's gonna feed my three kids and my diabetic mother with dementia? I'm a widow. And I got family down south. Who was going to help me? How could I quarantine at home without putting my family in danger? They weren't trying to give me a bed at the hospital. And when my results came in positive, they just told me to quarantine at home and to come back if my symptoms got worse. But where was I supposed to heal? By the grace of God, I stand here today before you as a survivor who had a generous coworker who let me quarantine in her guest bedroom. And while I was away, my mother's home health aide volunteered to work longer days and even slept over some nights. She considers us family. Even my oldest son, 
who just turned 17, stepped up and took care of his siblings. Lord knows how scary those days were as I laid up in a strange bed, not being able to fully breathe. But I thank God I had family who looked out for me. This is what community does, my people. I gathered us here today because I need you all to realize that what we are experiencing is a capitalistic pandemic. It is imperative that we take immediate action. But before I go on, let me ask y'all some validating questions. Raise your hand if the following is true for you. Once your hands are raised, please keep them up high in the air. How many of you have ever felt that your health care institution did not prioritize your health? How many times did a doctor refuse to give you pain medication because they didn't think your pain was severe enough, even during childbirth or a major surgery? How many of you have faced health discrimination because of your pre-existing conditions? How many of you do not trust this government? That's right. Every hand is up and it's within reason. Why should we trust this government with our health? Amen. Remember when all those nurses were furloughed back in April? Mm -hmm. I wasn't one of them, but I was disheartened by the fact that the hospitals were firing nurses during a national health crisis. This is because hospitals are businesses, my people. That's right. And just like a business, preventing bankruptcy during a pandemic means you must cut costs, like staff salaries. And here's the catch-22. Some sources revealed that many hospital CEOs were pocketing extra money. If you're wondering how that's possible, just look at the CARES Act. For those who are unfamiliar, the CARES Act is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which designated a total of $175 billion for COVID-19 response efforts. It offered reimbursement to healthcare entities for expenses or lost revenues. Hospitals were allocated $100 billion from the act itself, an additional $75 billion in loans from the Paycheck Protection Program. <laughs> Interestingly enough, most of the multi-million dollar PPP loans were granted to private and nonprofit hospitals with less than 500 employees. Not surprising, huh? However, the real downfall of the CARES Act is that funding allocation was based on past revenue. This disadvantaged many hospitals in underrepresented areas because black, indigenous, people of color populations generate lower revenues due to underinsurance and undertreatment. This is why the hospitals in our communities are receiving less relief right now. Did they even consider that we're the ones that need the relief the most? Did it not matter? As I mentioned earlier, this is a capitalistic pandemic, a clear case of racial capitalism. It's ironic, right? This CARES Act, they don't care about pre-existing conditions. They don't care that we take public transportation every day. They don't care that we live in inclusionary zoning and affordable dwelling units that tightly house hundreds of low income families in every building. They don't care that the majority of us are considered essential workers and are putting our lives on the line. These are the social issues that we face every day. And this is why black and Latino people are dying at disproportionate rates. The most blatant truth to reckon with right now is that COVID-19 is not an isolated health issue in our community. 
For years and years, racial capitalism has been the cause of health inequalities in the United States. Our lives have been devalued because of the color of our skin and socioeconomic statuses. The evidence is right under your nose. Just take Flint, Michigan as an example. Take a look at our history. The Tuskegee experimentation on black bodies, the sterilization of Puerto Rican women, the list is long and traumatic. But look around you family, look at this community. We gotta depend on each other so we can grow and survive. As the city continues to shut down this summer, some of our immediate goals should be assisting neighbors who are vulnerable to the heat and to be on the lookout for families who are living in abusive homes. Pastor Marks has graciously offered a few air conditioned rooms at the rectory, so let's make sure we get the right people in them. Miss Gloria can join us today, but she sent an email that suggested supermarket runs for the sick and elderly. I think that's a great idea and we should organize it soon. Underneath your chairs, you'll find some cards um, and pencils. Let's take a few moments to write down some ideas about other services and programs that we can offer. And if you got any fundraising thoughts, those are welcome too. I'll give y'all about five minutes to brainstorm and then we can share our responses. Good idea. And family, I just wanna remind you that we are descendants of survivors. Let's keep our faith strong and fight this thing. Let's work towards building a future that values black pain. Leave it to you to die of the wrong disease during a pandemic. Come on, man. It's 2020, not 1986. You're supposed to die of COVID, not AIDS, dumbass. It's uh, weird coming in here one at a time, you know? I mean, couldn't I just steal the urn? I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm just saying I could. Whole line of people out there. It looks longer because of spacing, but you know. You'll be hearing shit like this all day. Like so sad, so much potential, we'll miss you, blah, blah, blah. You know, here we thought we were getting old, but they're gonna say that 31 was in your prime. Yeah, so that's the twinks on grinder, but okay. Maybe one of them will steal your urn. Yeah, yeah, and they'll take you someplace poetic, like sprinkle you into the ocean, not realizing that if someone ever actually took you to the ocean, you would have complained the entire time about sand in your ass. But then, you'd become sand in someone else's ass, like revenge. Nah, but I guess they'd notice pretty quickly if you got stolen. You know, uh, 
They're putting you in a wall. Yeah, that's what your sister said. She came out of the woodwork somehow, so no sprinkling you over a lake or whatever. Listen, uh, Johnny isn't out there, so don't look for him. Yeah, he's um he's got this whole thing where he's telling people that you died because of negligence. And he's on this whole crusade about it. You, you see, they, they close the centers because of COVID, right? But he says that they only close them in the poor parts of town. In the rich parts of town where people have health insurance, those centers are open. Well, kind of open. But yeah, I guess he's got the numbers to back it up. I guess someone did a study. So Johnny's on a mission. But y'all were together for a hot minute. I think you should be here. I think you should be here. <laughs> you know, for a second, I didn't think I would be here until they put you in the wall. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I was told to expect a call from my public health official. It was the contact tracers. And for a second, I was like, whoa, 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 I already got HIV. <laughs> and, but it was the COVID tracing people. Yeah, you see, um, I went to uh, an in-person group because my head was all messed up from right after, you know. Um, and I guess someone there had it. And then I got a second one of those calls in five years. But, but I'm good. No, Miss Rona. <laughs> the lady on the phone was really weird too when I told her I was paused. She was like, um, I, uh, 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 and she said she didn't know if it could make it worse for me. So anyways, I just told her I would stay home and not sneeze on any grandmas and she said, okay. You know, I'm glad you never got a call like that. Because I remember when you were first diagnosed, you, you're, you could, you were a complete mess. I mean, you could barely talk to the contact tracers because your mind was spinning so fast. Not like that's any different for you, you drama queen, but I don't think, I don't think you would have liked the anxiety, you know, having to wait to find out if something new is living in your body. You know, but, but with COVID, the scare's not the same. We don't have those, um, those zombie pictures of people with kaposis and walking skeletons and shit that they used to scare people with in the 80s. No, no, no. With COVID, there are no pictures of the apocalypse happening on your skin. So nobody's afraid enough. You know, you know, they 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 didn't need to socially distance us. No, no, no. Everybody just ran for the hills on their own, talking about being clean and disease-free and staying away from us lepers. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the governor didn't need to tell people to do that. They, they did that on their, their own. They knew to stay away from the guy with HIV. So, maybe you wouldn't have freaked out so bad this time. Maybe that's not a good thing. But anyway, I couldn't get Dolly Parton here. I know, I know, that was your one request, and, and I feel you, but she didn't answer my call, so, you know. Uh, but it, it did get me thinking, do you, do you remember the time we tried to go see her and we drove all the way to Memphis, not realizing that Dollywood's on the whole ass other side of Tennessee? would have been closer to us too. We could have driven four hours. Instead, we drove 10 to some rundown Target parking lot. That's the last time I let you plan a road trip. But I remember, you know, we, we us settling down, um, trying to get comfortable and trying to get a couple hours of shut eye because there was, no way we could get to Dollywood and get you home on time for you to get to work. And um, I remember just looking at you and seeing you leaned back in the driver's seat and 
I was getting comfortable in the passenger seat. Mm -hmm. Some asshole was spray painting from the wall across from us. And, um, and I, I, I thought about kissing you, but you were with Johnny. And even though I don't get your whole old man thing, like, I don't care what you say, the guy does look 50, but I got you. You know, I don't think Johnny's right about the clothes centers killing you. I saw you falling off. I, I've seen you go through some serious moody phases when depression hit you because you acted like a whole child, even if you don't want to admit it or not. I just, I didn't know it could get so bad if you stop taking your meds. Like, I, I don't get how someone does that. Like, HIV is not a death sentence anymore. It sucks. And it'll eat your paycheck and worse if you don't stay poor enough for government assistance. But you're not supposed to die. I mean, look at me. I'm in the best shape of my life. I've never been to the doctor so much, you know? You found a way to die. You must have. And I think it's easy for Johnny to go run around blaming the closed centers than it is to realize that it was your own doing, whether you meant to or not. It was you. It must have been months. It's not like you just... Stop taking your meds and you die. It was weeks and weeks of me calling and you saying you were okay. A little sad, but okay. Maybe if I'd seen you at a group, I would have noticed you getting skinnier and sicker. But here, I just thought it was just a shitty lighter on your computer look, making you look that way. I didn't know you weren't showing up for work. How could I if I wasn't pestering you for free tacos on my lunch break? But you were okay, a little sad, but okay. You know, I, I called Johnny after I came to see you and I saw that you were all, you know, and, um, and he didn't say anything for a while. And then he said, that he knew so many kids that died of AIDS during the crisis that he doesn't even remember their names. And then he hung up. I guess when you're the only one that makes it out alive, you're not ready to turn back around for no one. But I think, I think you should be here. Oh shit, I've been in here too long. Listen, man, I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to come see you like this. I, I know it's not about me, but I, I don't want to have to come see your name in some cement on every birthday or every anniversary. So fuck it. We're doing this. We're going to Dollywood. Hello, everyone. Welcome to COVID Monologues with HowlRound. Um, thank you so much to HowlRound for hosting us today. Uh, we're very happy that you have joined us as audience members and that we are here. Um, so 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about COVID monologues, and then we'll enter a discussion with all of these wonderful artists that you see here. Uh, COVID monologue organizers are on the unceded land of the Piscataway peoples, tended to by the Susquehannock, Lenape, and Lumbee peoples, currently known as Baltimore, Maryland, the Kickapoo, Consett, and Osage peoples, currently known as Kansas City, Missouri, and the Wasaho Nation, currently known, known as Lake Tahoe, Nevada. We ask that you join us in acknowledging these people, their elders, both past and present, and as well as future generations. We also ask that you acknowledge the communities of the unceded land where you reside on personally today. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism. It has been over a year since the first case of community spread COVID in the United States. Since then, over 31 million Americans have been infected and the virus has changed our society in ways we've never imagined. Before we jump into our discussion, please join us in a brief moment of silence for the 526,000 Americans and almost 3 million people globally who have lost their lives to COVID-19 as of April 13th, 2021. Thank you so much. I would now like to introduce to you our project leads that we have with us today and also tell you a little bit more about our artistic process for COVID monologue. We are a group of public health researchers with a love for theater and theater professionals with a love for public health. I am Genevieve Demai, the artistic director of Single Carrot Theater in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm Sarania Thamaraja. I'm a theater artist and a public health researcher based at John Hopkins. Hi, I'm Jess Rasp, a partnering producer and the producer for The Wrong Disease. And I'm Emily Hurley. I'm an assistant professor of population health at the Children's Mercy Research Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. In these challenging times, our goal was to bring researchers, artists, and you together in a deeper shared understanding of the pandemic's impact on society. We started by searching scientific journals and drawing out the main messages of peer-reviewed research on the lived experiences of Americans during COVID-19. And we grouped them into distinct topics. Today, you saw the, the topics of HIV and COVID and racial disparities and COVID. When we found all this research, we assembled it into research packets uh, for these eight topics that were to be assigned to playwrights that we found through a nationwide search. We also had a playwriting workshop where we brought in experts in research-based theater, and we gave some tools for playwrights in consuming literature in, in the history of research-based theater in public health in conducting in-depth interviews, which is a tool that many researcher artists use to create this kind of work and incorporating a call to action. But when we gave the playwrights the instructions, we did not direct them to use any particular method. We simply said, we want you to communicate one or more main messages of this research in a 10 minute monologue. So they were allowed their own artistic interpretation but all the work was workshopped with a group of public health researchers familiar with the work and theater professionals. COVID Monologues brings together 35 artists and studies from over 100 public health researchers. We selected eight playwrights through a competitive application process that was adjudicated by volunteers in the theater field. We tasked the selected playwrights with writing the monologues based on the research and we gathered five theater companies based in Baltimore, Maryland, including Single Carrot Theater, Two Strikes Theater Collective, Arena Players Inc., The Strand Theater Company, and Fells Point Corner Theater. We matched playwrights with theaters and then tasked the theaters with selecting their artistic teams, workshopping the script and the playwright and with the playwright and then mounting these pieces to be filmed. COVID monologues is a unique intersection of scientific research and art and an experiment whether these disparate industries can work together to build communities and share knowledge and information.
This project was made possible by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund, sponsored by the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, and implemented in partnership with the Partners of the Americas. Please go to covidmonologues.com to learn more about the project, watch and share all the videos, and connect with community organizations. In the spirit of research, we encourage you to please complete the post-performance survey by scanning the QR code on your screen with your phone camera or by going to covidmonologues.com and following the survey link. So today you have seen two of these eight monologues. Black Pain by Kristen Eve Cato, directed by Ladrian Wetzel and produced by Two Strikes Collective, and The Wrong Disease by Lane Stanley, directed by Ben Pierce and produced by Jess Rasp. Artists, if you could introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourself in a sentence or two. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Kristen. I um, play right for, for Black Pain uh, and I am a New York City-based playwright and performer. And I am representing the Jamaican and Puerto Rican community out here in the Muncie Lenape lands. And I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, uh, my name is Aladrian Wetzel. Uh, I am the uh, executive director of Two Strikes Theater Collective, a, a theater that was created for and by and about black women to uh, empower them in their stories. And uh, I've always called myself the odd man out. I'm a theater lover, but I'm also an engineer. So it's perfect that I got a chance to participate in this kind of art meets science uh, environment. So can't wait to talk later. Hi everyone, my name is Lane Stanley. I'm a filmmaker and playwright currently uh, based in Los Angeles and I wrote Wrong Disease for COVID Monologues. Hi, I'm Ben Pierce, is the director for Wrong Disease. I am coming from the Baltimore city area and I'm a freelance artist around the area as well. Thank you. And of course we also have Sarah Nia Tarmaraja and Emily Hurley on the public health side to engage in this conversation about the intersection of science and art. Um, so I'd love to hear first from playwrights um, about how this process of starting with academic and scientific research how did that alter your process? Um, how did you, did you learn anything new about your work or how you work? Were there aspects that challenged you? Um, were there in moments that you found enriching or surprising in this process? Well, um, usually when I'm writing, like when I'm writing any play or Sorry, my phone. <laughs> Usually, when I'm writing anything, I'm character. I'm character first, story first, idea first, and um, and this process was different because it was information first. It was research first, and and it was through the research that I um, created the character, that I created the situation. It was through um, the reading of of these studies that. I discover the world and usually um, I discover the world first and then I do research if necessary. And so for this process, it was very much um, research first and then building the world through those lenses. And that was interesting for me. And I was very new to my process and um, I enjoyed it. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, I did, I did, I definitely learned uh, something from this process and it, and it was that it was, it was learning how to create a world based on information that you receive. And I feel like I can definitely do that again somewhere down the line, depending on, mm -hmm. you know, what the topic is that I'm writing about. So that was really cool. Yeah, I absolutely agree uh, with Kristen. It was definitely a new experience for me in some ways. Um, I usually do a lot of research for the things that I'm writing, uh, but I tend to do a little more community-based, interview-based, like both formal and informal style research, which means that my research is extremely anecdotal and that's kind of the point of it, right? And so for me, part of that is being really rigorous and creating plays about uh, making sure that we're not trying to speak for everyone or represent an experience, right? That plays and films are specific stories about specific people and how can that be clear like within what we're making? Um, but uh, 
But this was kind of the opposite. So where I would conduct, I would speak to a large number of people and see, you know, what I saw as trends across those conversations, across those experiences. Whereas this was kind of a report that gave me the trends um, without the people necessarily, or at least without the the face to face, you know, emotional interaction, um, which is really fascinating, you know, and it definitely felt like um, in both of those cases, you're still ultimately looking at a blank page, even if you're building on a lot of things, um, you're still creating a work of fiction, right? Um, and that means that you have a lot of control over the character you're creating and the world you're building as Kristen just spoke to so beautifully. Um, and I think for me going forward, I think like both of those can work together in tandem right like that just because you're talking to a lot of people doesn't mean you can't also find like a more sociological text or like a peer-reviewed research article to bring in and uh work to find like okay here are the individual stories that like i've i've been able to hear uh and then how are those fitting within like a broader conceptual framework or societal context um of like a kind of larger scale conversation about these things um which i think is exciting. I feel excited about that. <laughs> I know that um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question, which is that, um, you know, in the, early on in this process, um, for everybody watching, we had uh, some peer conversations with the playwrights presenting the research and talking about research-based theater and how we were planning on approaching this process. Um, and there was a moment um, and I don't remember which of the playwrights it was. So if it wasn't you both, you'd be like, I was good. Um, <laughs> if you want to expand on it, feel free to. Um, where it, this, the, sometimes playwrights felt like kind of an overwhelm of information with all the data and articles and trying to figure out like what direction to pick and what story to pick and, and where to develop a story. And I wonder if you can recall way back to that moment in October or November of 2020, um, kind of, you know, with this being a different way of working, how you how you kind of overcame that that hump if you felt if you felt that kind of obstacle in front of you. I would say I, I it wasn't such an obstacle. It was a challenge for sure, but it, it was more like like what Lane was saying earlier. It was exciting. It was exciting to do and um and I really liked the the you know putting like these puzzles together and like and like putting and like making these lists. I Aladian was very very helpful in this process. Um, we we had a lot of conversations. We spoke a lot about our own experiences because we both knew we wanted this character to be a black woman. And so I think I think that was like you know the the blueprint. We're like okay we need we know we need a, a black woman. We know we need and I knew I wanted I I knew that she had to be educated in a sense where she knew what was going on because there was so there was so much like scientific jargon that I, I wanted her to understand and, and that I wanted her to be able to um, convey and to communicate to her people to her community to, to her community and so um, we knew that she had to have she that she she had to come from an educational background somehow whether it was um, whether she was a doctor or a nurse or someone who really understood these these difficult terms and how to and how to um, deliver it to the people in the community who who don't quite understand it from that level, and I think um, so that was the challenge. But I really thought I, I really thought it was it was fun to do, and it wasn't such an obstacle. And I feel like it was because of the conversations Elijah and I had. It was because of these mm -hmm. you know these anecdotes that we had ourselves and these stories that we had ourselves. And so I think that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was an obstacle. So I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and disagree with that. But it was, it was a fun challenge, though, and it was really, I, I learned a lot about myself and my voice through this process too. So I was grateful for that. Yeah, I agree. I think that there was so much freedom. You know, at no point where we handed like a giant stack of papers and said, like, you need to incorporate all of this, you know, and I think that that would have um, like if there's specific things that we were trying to get across um, and like a large number of specific things, you know, there's only so much information that you can fit into a 10 minute monologue that's also trying to tell a story and have a character and all of that. Right. Um, and so I felt a lot of freedom to find what stood out to me, which also felt like a big responsibility to highlight like what in this research do I personally think needs 
needs to be heard, that might be really different from what you think should have been highlighted from the research, right? Um, and so that's a little bit tricky too. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I think most of us are, are trying to say something, trying to convey something that is real through all place, right? Whether that's just like something that we have experienced, you know, some kind of human truth or emotion, um, or if it's, you know, more fully a, a political message play. Um, so I guess it didn't feel uh, new to me to try to sneakily embed <laughs> uh, facts and perspectives into, mm -hmm. into a play. Yeah, especially because, like I said, I think if, if that was really specifically given to me, um, of like these three facts, put them in. Not that it, not that it wouldn't have been possible to do creatively. Um, that's just a little bit of a different thing to me. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of freedom in this process. Yeah, I, I second that. The, the freedom made it made the creative process a lot, like you know, a lot easier for sure, for sure. And probably I think later in this discussion, we'll get into kind of um, what the ingredients would be for future projects like this. And it seems like that's definitely a takeaway of like mm -hmm. balancing the information and the creative freedom so that um, so that art, the artists can be artists. And I know that as the project leads, those were many conversations we had and kind of sorting out uh, those boundaries and, and allowing for that freedom of of letting the artist be artists, but also staying true to the research and, and where do those lines fall and how much do we let go of those? How much do we let go of that research or hold on to it? Mm -hmm. um, and like entering that negotiation. I, I'd be, um, since since HowlRound is a theater platform, um, I'd love to hear from the public health researchers about what the typical life is of public health research. Um, where does it go? Who sees it? Who consumes it? Um, what's its impact, and and how this project is is different from the typical life of public health research? Do you want to start? I can start. You can go ahead. Okay, um, it's a great question. We, you know always tried to publish in peer reviewed journals. And, you know, the main audience of peer reviewed journals are other scientists. So that's where the bulk of our work lives. When we talk about health communication, though, you know, I think as a field, we do a good job with um, getting headlines out that have new statistics, um, or um, really kind of nuggets of information that the population might need to know just for our own health and safety. We don't do a good job of fostering understanding of the stories behind the data and the lived experience. And as public health researchers, we do do a lot of research that tries to become more contextual, that really tries to get in depth about um, what people are experiencing when it comes to their health, because that is essential for us when we go to design health programs, when we go to try to make services better. We do need more than numbers. We do need to understand the stories behind them. And we conduct a lot of that research, but the understanding that we gain from it doesn't really go outside of our circles very, very much and very widely. And um, it's a shame because it is, um, it, it is something very close to what theater tries to do is to communicate stories. And I think this project was so special because we were able to kind of take the world of stories that we were working on and give them to the hands of people who are more expert than us in actually communicating them in a way that engages an audience. So to get more than just the facts, more than just the headlines of how effective the vaccines are, to get some of that context about what researchers are learning about the experience into an artistic performance was a, a really great way for us to just, I think, communicate that information beyond our circles. Um, I'd be curious for directors and producers if, you know, there's a couple of components of this project that were different. One, making film theater during COVID, of course, um, but also workshopping a piece that um, is about things happening in our world right now. Um, if this process was different for you, what this work meant for you or your organization, um, what was, what felt special about this project or meaningful that you're taking away from COVID monologues? 
Um, I mean, I can go first. Uh, I think this this felt especially especially special. Uh, this felt really special um, uh, because obviously, you know, Two Strikes Theater Collective, you know, is a theater that you know is meant to amplify and support and encourage Black women's voices. So obviously, it was a wonderful treat to be able to work, um, you know, with uh, with Kristen, right? Um, and like she said earlier, we got a, a, a had a lot of good conversations. Um, which you don't always get a chance to do when you're directing. You normally get the play, you direct it, you you know you you, you present it. You don't always have that direct conversation with the playwright. And we were almost, uh, you know, Chris Kristen's work, but uh, we had a lot of conversations and wanted to make sure that like certain things were included, um, you know, in the work. Uh, and so not only did we use the actual, um, you know, the research and data that were provided, I read the research too, just to make sure I had an understanding of what Kristen was coming into. Um, but because we're living, we're living and breathing this stuff right now, um, I remember sending Kristen and the actor uh, a bunch of different like news articles um, about you know black women and how they were in, uh, impacted by COVID uh, and about talking about, you know, black and brown communities uh, that were di directly, um, you know, affected by this horrible disease. It's happening right now. So the fact that we were able to kind of not only leverage the the research, but also use those realistic, those real stories to kind of help to support um, support the actual work is something that you don't always get the chance to do when you're, um, you know, when you're directing a directing a piece. So I think that was that was that that really helped the the process, and I think it really helped. Uh, Kristen develop a, a very interesting and, and real character um, to talk about a very uh, real disease that's happening right now. Yeah, I'll um, piggyback on top of that. Um, it's funny listening to um, Aladrian and Kristen um, talking and how many similarities there were between our processes mm -hmm. and everything, even though we were talking about two specialized issues. Um, uh, the talking about the really personal stories and the lived experiences and using anecdotes and and all of those things um were all within the process that the lane and i uh we had lots of conversations as well in development through the process um ours, ours was a little bit um i'd say one of the few differences though within ours was um we we very quickly um latched on to the idea of um, because the HIV um, pandemic is ongoing along with um, the COVID pandemic being in the moment and it being more actively affecting people and the stigmas and, and all of the different things involved, we're seeing that repeat of history um, where the institutional memory has kind of disappeared in the last 10 years as um, leaps and bounds in HIV research and medicine has um, made it a much more um, livable condition. It's not the death sentence that people used to think that it was. So that was something that we really focused in on and, and the idea of the funeral and all of that and um, having a point where they just um, kind of slam together in the moment to really create a a real but also a very interesting you know because theater it you know it's, it can be real but it also needs to be interesting too um and that was the perfect scenario that lane came up with of the the funeral and trying to balance the two and then within the theater world uh we did have conversations of the history of um hiv plays and and their effect on the theater world especially as there's a classicness to them but it is one of the more recent um, sort of theaters subgenres of a while. So, so um, having these conversations, not only about the data, but then also about all of these different arenas and how they sort of intersect with each other uh, were really vital to the process and how we helped sort of, like Kristen was saying, like what was the model that we would, uh, that we kind of developed into this to create this very finite story to cover all of these different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben, I, I think it was just, it was a really, it had to be a delicate balance, right? Very Between, much. yeah, you, you don't want to go too far to the, too far on one side and have too much research specific information because then that's not interesting. That's just, you might as well just read the, read the research article, right? Yeah. At that point. <laughs> uh, but then you don't want to go too far. I mean, you, you do want to lean onto the personal, but you don't want to lose the whole intent of this project, right? It was to, convey very specific information. So it really was a very interesting marriage and balance of those two of those pieces. Um, and uh, 
I think we, I think we, I think we got a home run. I think we succeeded. I think so. I think so. It seems I think like so. to me, right? <laughs> right. And and one thing too, um, within ours that we wanted to bounce because again, going back to that history of HIV plays and where we are with that pandemic, there there is a history of very very um, dark and and um, dour plays, and we wanted to balance that out a bit. Um, so that it wasn't just a downer piece because, um, again, it was that keeping the interest, but also like adding to the canon of stories that are not just sad stories as well. Like, yes, the friend had died and everything, but there was a lot of great things that also happened in those lived moments as well. So, so try, so like, like Aladrian said, like that, that was an additional balance that we, that we, um, tackled as well. Lane and I did. Yeah, I want to add something to what Ben just said that really, um, I, I feel like, you know, that's what that's what I was aiming for with this call to action. It's like, you know, it's, and it's a lady was talking about, you know, it was so it's that we're writing this and it's happening in real time and that this is a, this is actually occurring at the same time. And so it's like, you know, writing writing this piece while these while this pandemic is happening it's like well i felt it was a duty to to connect with the audience to connect with the community and so and so yeah i just thank you ben for for mentioning that you know like when you said that you know this is why we wanted to add this element that's why i wanted to add that element because i think it was important definitely because yeah it's bad black pain they don't respect mm -hmm. it they're not you know like but but what can we do about it so yeah, thanks. I think on that note, it was really important to the team to really dive into the heart of this project being communicating those real character lived experiences. And I think everybody on the team did a, a wonderful job communicating those ideas and, and it definitely brings the emotional core to the front that I think will help audiences connect more, more deeply with those experiences and those characters and see themselves and their experience also as a story worth telling and worth um, communicating to the people around them. And so we hoped with this project to really inspire people to think beyond what they saw here to themselves and to their community and what more can we do together as we weather this. I think also with the end pieces, we definitely wanted them to be artistic and not really on the research side because at the end of the day, we can just read that research paper. So I think we gave a lot of leeway with the artists. But I think what was interesting and in how some re some artists ended up using the research a lot and even taking quotes uh, from the articles themselves and the interviews themselves and incorporated it in to uh, their monologues. But then on the other hand, some artists took major themes and maybe the structural issues uh, of their public health problem and integrated that into their monologue. But whether how research oriented they were, they all came across as really strong artistic pieces. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think it was important that even if you showed this monologue and didn't say um, it was research based or anything, that people wouldn't question it as a piece of art and could just consume it um, as a piece of theater, as a monologue. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like, especially, you know, again, with the playwrights in those early conversations, there were some questions like, is this a PSA? Is this a what is this? And, um, and I think really having something that stands on its own that that doesn't feel like um, that that is a, that is a story that isn't just like disseminating mm -hmm. information with a face saying the words um, that it that it is actually a story that has a deeper meaning that has a deeper relevance um, and kind of hits 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 the human experience in a lot of different places. Uh, I am going to pivot into that, you know, I both I think both public health and theater are these industries that really strive for relevance. And we all dream of making huge social change and making impact and changing lives for the better. And, um, you know, both of our industries are 
are tackling that from like completely different angles. And there are there are intersections, but there's also like these completely different angles that we're tackling that from. Um, and so I'd love to hear from everybody who has thoughts about this. You know, we did we do have this audience. One, we're we're creating this theater out from data um, that exists that public health researchers have done. And then on the other side of that, um, Emily and Serenia have have a survey for the audience for you all that is also collecting data to really like to like measure the impact of this project, which you know theaters have audience surveys and things like that, and we we like uh, try sometimes theaters as institutions try to measure that impact, but but in this way we have this this cap of of like actually soliciting measurement and feedback um, from the people watching. Whereas I feel like as theater, as many times we're like, I hope people liked it. I hope it, I hope it meant something to somebody. I hope it changed somebody's life. But we never, never really know unless somebody, like an audience, one audience member is like, that was so meaningful to me. That changed my life, um, which is such a special gift when it comes. But so I'd be really curious. You know, we have this this data and quantifying and measuring someone's experience artistically, but also measuring impact, and then also what we each do as as industries to to strive to make impact and to and to change lives and to make a difference in the world that was that's a question apparently <laughs> <laughs> um but but you know if anybody has any has any thoughts on that I don't, you know i know emily and serenia have some of that data um and is there anything that we as theater artists can can learn from that and and what can the public health industry learn from theater and art making? I mean, I think, you know, we have learned so much through this process and we've heard our public health colleagues who have attended the, the performances have learned so much about this process too, because you said it so beautifully, we're all really caring about some of these really big issues that we wanna tackle. And we're pressured a lot to put what we learn in boxes and really try to make it very clean. And we don't always take the time to sit and think about what our findings mean within people's broader experiences and within their real um, lives that they're living. People are so complex and they don't fit into the boxes that we like to put them in all of the time when we make our conclusions. And to just take that time to sit for 10 minutes and listen to a person with a story that's living out a finding that came out brings a whole new perspective for us and our work and grounds it in what we're actually like trying to do with this information. And I think from the theater side, you know, the playwrights and directors have already talked a lot about what they've learned from the process. And I, I hope that um, theater artists will sort of go to public health research more often to inspire their work. I know Lane talked about um, doing interviews in the field as part of the research when creating plays, you know, anyways. But um, a lot of the techniques that we use in who do we talk to? How do we find them? How do we set aside our own biases and try to learn about what, what, we're, what we're trying to get at with a research question from these folks? I think that whole process in doing that as a researcher, I always find art in it, but I, I hardly ever find artists that are <laughs> going to make it into art. So I think our process of, of researching the human experience can be something valuable to theater. And there, it's already overlapping so much with, with what theater artists already do. We just need to learn from each other more and, and share our experiences in the work. And then as far as the surveys, um, you know, I, I know there's always audience feedback surveys, but I think one of the things that we really want to learn from this survey in particular is not just what people thought, but who thought what. So who did we reach? Who What spoke to certain types of people and why? Who didn't we reach? And when we're looking at public health messaging, we want to reach everybody and we want to reach people who... Um, you know, might not necessarily be on board with um, a lot of the public health measure, measures we're trying to 
put out there, especially for COVID. So I, you know, I think learning about who our audience was, and we had people of all ages, backgrounds, professions, students, we had people who had different um, political uh, leanings. And I think when we go through their comments and go through their, um, uh, do some analyses about what they felt about different monologues, we could really understand who who we reached with this information and how we might want to, um, you know, improve next time to affect people that um, we might not have gotten in our in our enthusiastic audience this time around. Yeah, for me, I've been doing theater as a kid, so actually much longer than I've been a public health researcher. So for me, I think I've always seen the fusion of the two. Um, and I think I've just seen, gotten a lot of pushback about putting the two together. And I think meeting Emily was um, one of the moments that I really confirmed that, you know, these two things can go together. And for me, public health and theater are really similar in that we're really looking at a problem and we're collecting these stories. Uh, and as a researcher, as a playwright, uh, I think I'm doing the same processes. So even though these disciplines may seem very different at the core, I think they're very similar as Genevieve mentioned before. And um, this project has really given me, um, you know, the fortitude and the strength to keep going um, in various topics. The interesting thing about research-based theater, I think it really communicates uh, public health issues that may not be really relevant to people. I may open their eyes, but with COVID monologues, everyone kind of knows about COVID and has a unique perspective with it, which while they might be watching it or taking part in the artistic process may bring to it. But, you know, COVID at the end of the day is an infectious disease, uh, which might sound boring um, to a lot of people, but, you know, this really demonstrate that even in an infectious disease, there's so many different stories um, and perspectives that this show has really brought to light. And I really hope that in the future, we can do this with infectious diseases, chronic diseases, uh, social and behavioral parts of public health moving forward. Um, to, to echo Serenia as well, that's a, uh, basically what I was going to contribute is that um, I personally, with the work that I do with other theaters, have already seen applications, particularly like Serenia was just saying, in the more socioeconomic, um, social justice um, interviewing type things. Like uh, we we have thing um, a series of one theater we're doing that's called Dialogue for Change, where we are having conversations based on interviews with people and creating performances based on this. And this happened um, particularly um, at the, it, it, it was in at the same time as this, we were starting to have the ideas, but I'm so thankful that this project came along at the same time because then it gave me the tools. Um, and that's how I view it as the tools of being able to go into research and do this. So I've now personally added to my toolkit and I'm hoping a lot of people who see this and hear this, particularly this discussion will um, now feel like they have another tool of sources of inspiration to affect either things scientifically, sociologically, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. I, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Kristen. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I agree. Like, I feel like theater has a history of, of, um, of doing, of, of, of having like a research-based uh, beginning. Like anything from like docu documentary theater to epic style Brechtian theater. Like, I feel like there's just a history of theater artists and playwrights and theater makers and creators who, who do the research to talk about the things that are going on in the world at that moment. And so, um, and so, you know, doing this project and, and engaging in this research-based theater process felt very organic. So um, I'm happy that the research and, and, the, and the health health and scientific industry is looking at theater now saying, hey, let's branch together. Cause I feel like theater has always been doing that. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say that uh, I, me as a as my, a playwright in my own right, um, this project definitely inspired me uh, to do um, some more research-based theater specifically uh, on a topic that is always kind of 
um, interested me um, in that topic is uh, uh, the mortality rate of, uh, of black women um, when they have uh, and when they have babies. Um, so that that's I'm in the process of kind of starting the the research and and uh, and creating what that framework uh, will look like. And because of my involvement in this. Um, I feel like I, I I feel a little bit more comfortable in in how to approach the approach the process, not only from an artistic perspective, but also um, from an, a, a a research science based uh, platform as well. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'll be I'll be emailing like Emily and Sarah and Nia, be like, hey, I got some questions. <laughs> we'll see how it works. So. I feel like in addition to content and processes around creation of theater, there's also more that we theater world can take from public health. Just like, I feel like where we, and I, I don't mean to speak for anybody other than myself, but I know within me, there is like a slightly mystical touchy feely current. That's a little allergic to like data. Like the idea of quantifying a reaction to a play is like, oh, you know, like something we just doesn't like it. Um, but at the same time, like, uh, even if it's not literally, because I think my mind goes to like a robotic chart where you like check, like I felt sad here, happy here, you know, like there's, I'm certainly like a middle ground, you know, between like a, a, that and a talk back of, because like, yeah, ultimately we do, uh, we get better and better at our work the more that we understand what is actually lodging in an audience's mind, right? Like that's how like audiences tell us what we're actually communicating and whether that's in line with what we intended to communicate or not um, and sharpening like how we reach different kinds of audiences. Like um, exactly like Sarah Neo was saying of like, so I'm trans, I'm working on a lot of trans stuff and like as much as I wanna make, um, you know, great trans representation for trans audiences, I also want people to see trans stories who wouldn't necessarily want to do that. You know what I mean? Like that's part of changing the perception too. Um, when we're talking about like societal impact, I think both of those are important. And so um, understanding who you're reaching and how you're reaching them is like a huge part of an activism side of theater making, right? Um, so I don't have an answer to like what that middle ground is between just like asking people in a talk back after the show to like my robot chart that like, you know, we put a little thing on their finger and we check their heart rate. Um, I'm sure that's not a real thing. Let's not be, let's not do that. Um, but, but I feel like there is more that we can learn, more that we can, more research that we can do. I'm sure also that somebody out there is like watching this like, we're all doing that and you just don't know about it. In which case, I would just like to learn more about that. I, I think Lane put it so beautifully. And I think for both of our fields, you know, with the big problems we need to solve, we all need to become more comfortable with existing somewhere between objectivity and subjectivity. And I think for public health, we know we can't solve all of our problems and really make a dent if we're trying to be completely objective and checking the boxes all the time. And for theater, maybe coming a little bit, you know, towards the more objectivity science everything is messy in these in these problems that we're grappling with and having those per different perspectives where you know we're really trying to find truth from those different angles i think both of our fields can you know come together in the middle and try to exist together and grapple with it a little more and and really learn a lot I'm really um, interested in the call to action aspect of the two fields joining too, and what impact that can look like moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Great, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you viewers for joining us as well. If you wanna hear more about COVID monologues and talk with some different artists, you can join us for our second COVID monologues conversation on April 20th. Um, and if you're watching this after April 20th, it's on HowlRound's website forever and ever, amen. Um, and again, thank you all artists for joining us and thank you Sarah Nia for being the mastermind behind this amazing project and bringing all of us together. Thank you all so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.